So the Flying Stroke Community Space was started on um, Halloween of 2009. We consider ourselves sort of a radical community space. We're very um, focused on giving people space to meet that are having issues in their communities. And um, you know, doing programming like this to get people out to find out about different subject matters and you know, hear what's going on around the country. Um, the website to squirrel.org. And I'm going to turn over to Leslie from Buffalo. You can come up, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm oh, Leslie. Sure. I'm just going to introduce Peg. We are, uh, Nate and Shante and I are all from Burning Books. And their little table here is some stuff that kind of relates more or less to what Peg's got going on. We've got some good calendars. If you're not organized yet for 2012, the calendar, get organized. and be a good year. It's 2014. <laughs> 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 So, uh, yeah, I just, uh, Peg wanted me to introduce her. For people who aren't familiar, Peg Millet is a legend and a hero in my world. Uh, when I first, uh, first got involved in sort of like environmental movement, there was this idea that this vague concept that Earth First was out there in the woods somewhere sabotaging bulldozers. And I was probably 16, 17, I think, and trying to find Earth. Where was Earth First? I want to join up. It wasn't so easy, but um, and when I found out what Earth First really was, it didn't quite match up those those sort of dreams of everything that I had. But actually, I think part of those sort of illusions of what Earth First Monkey Wrenching in the Night was all about was a lot of it came from Peg and her group and what they were actually doing. And um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Earth First, but you know it's a sort of above ground activist group. But there's also notions that people would kind of affiliated with Earth First to go out and sneak out in the middle of the night and do some like small scale sabotage to stop forests from being cut down or other kind of mining operations and stuff like that. So uh, uh, when I did find Earth First, I, I found them sitting in trees and doing civil disobedience and getting arrested and that was awesome, but it wasn't this sort of sneaky Robin Hood type of thing that I had in my mind. And then later on down the road, um, I did find that there was some of that TV Robin Hood type of stuff, and Peg is going to tell us a little bit about that tonight. So, we'll Peg Millet. I really, really appreciate being here because um, the stuff that I did happened over 20 years ago, and the stuff that happened before me, there was a lot of stuff that happened before me. There was a lot of people that were doing small scale stuff. I was one of them. We did uh, small stuff like we get mad at some developer and we go and mess up his his uh, bulldozer and cut down um, things like billboards and that sort of thing. And and that there was always in Earth First when it started in the 80s, um, it was sort of a prankster crew. A lot of these people that were involved that got started with Earth First were um, frustrated um, uh, mainstream people that were going to Washington to try and lobby to change the way um, things were going uh, with the government on public lands, for public lands. And I'm from the West, and there's a lot of public lands out there. Um, most of the stuff that happened in California was on private lands, which is a whole different perspective and different to see. And so Judy Berry's story is different than my story, which I was down in Arizona. Um, there's <coughs> There a lot of people uh, doing a lot of things. Uh, there were the bolt weevils that was way before Earth First even, and they were going around um, taking knocking the bolts off of the great big high tension power lines because for years they were trying to go through the channels to stop this great big power line that was going across Minnesota, and so the farmers just went, well, we'll just take matters into our own hands. And they didn't use any weapons, they just used wrenches. So <clears throat> that kind of thing is a really old and long legacy, and I totally um, didn't appreciate that until after I got more involved and in, in, found out I was a political prisoner, which I wasn't, didn't, wasn't aware of and all that kind of stuff. So uh, <clears throat> I, too, got involved with Earth First because I was looking... I wasn't looking to do any of this nasty stuff, the sabotage stuff. Um, what I was looking to do was find some way to get around. Well, I just didn't know that there were other people that thought like I did. And when I found um, Dave Foreman's um, 
an interview in the Mother Earth News in 1984, and it was a plowboy interview, and they were talking to him. He was talking about this fellow they called the Swamp Fox, and he went into the big offices somewhere down in the south, down Alabama or someplace like that, <clears throat> where some of these people were putting lots of pollutants into the rivers and they took that sludge that they got out of the pipes going into the rivers and brought that stuff into the high rises and, and dumped it on. And the, the Swamp Fox was one of the people that did that and they never caught him. And so it was a way for them to bring attention to <coughs> the, way, the, the way people were running roughshod over the, the planet without any regard for health, welfare, or any of that stuff. So, I read this article and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe there's so many things like I do. So I went and found out where they were based, which happened to be in Tucson, Arizona, which is great because I was up in the north um, of Arizona. I was in the Central Mountains <coughs> outside of Prescott. And I, they had a rendezvous every year. It was called Randomer Rendezvous. And so I went to that uh, for the first time in 1985 and was just blown away by all these people that uh, knew how to camp. They were very careful about their camping. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh, I have uh, cold water and hot water. I got all kinds of water now. Um, thank you very much. So I found this group of people that I could really identify with. They were students. A lot of them were, um, were biologists. Uh, we were all involved in learning about natural history. and. In learning about natural history, seeing what was unhealthy for the natural history, learning about flora and fauna. So I got really involved with this crowd. And we did mostly civil disobedience and we did mostly street theater, which is totally my scene. I love street theater. So because I identify with non humans way better than I identified with humans, I would be in a raccoon suit or something like that when we did demos. And so um, I would be on the news as a raccoon, so nobody knew who I was. They just saw this raccoon doing crazy stuff on the news if they did it. Now the thing is, in that day, in that time, um, our uh, attention, drawing attention to uh, issues like Mount Graham and the, and the um, San Francisco peaks and uh, the Grand Canyon uranium mining and the mining situation and the overgrazing situation and all that kind of stuff was much easier to do this now because the media actually put these demonstrations on the news. <clears throat> that hasn't happened in a long time, and so it's gone into different directions. And so what I'm telling you is historical because it really has not much bearing on what's happening now, except there's still going to be um, informants out there, there's still going to be the FBI out there, there's still going to be people that are trying to trip you up. And so um, it's very, very important for us all to, for me, anyways, at that time I learned a lot of lessons the hard way. And so one of the reasons that I went on the road for a long time was to actually try and educate people about staying away from the pitfalls. Because I really believe that it takes all different kinds of activism um, to make these changes. And the biggest activism is maybe not the most visible activism. And um, Maybe I do know that I have seen <clears throat> hopeless situations where everyone had turned their backs, like for Matt Brown, and this little group of people who called Earth First said, we're going in and we don't care. We're going to try and stop the bastards. And so what we would do is, I don't know if you know what Mount Graham is, but it's a sacred mountain to, according to all the Apache people, and <clears throat> also to other um, indigenous peoples that live down there. So. It's also a most amazing biodiverse um, Pleistocene sort of relic because it's the last place and the s most southern place where these great big Engelmann spruce live. <clears throat> the, mount the little red squirrel that you have out here, that comes from down there. That is a, a, a red squirrel, the angry red squirrel that my friend Dwight um, Metzger um, put out in hundreds and thousands of uh, of ways, like on t-shirts and everywhere, and we were <clears throat> and representing the Red Squirrel with that little emblem there. It was really cool to see that when I was coming in here. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, that Red Squirrel 
<coughs> was what the <coughs> biologists use to put a, a wrench in the cog of the wheels. Down in the southern Arizona, there's the University of Arizona. There's the Max Planck Institute. There's all these people that want to, you know, the, the Vatican of all places, um, that wanted to put up on the top of Mount Graham, which is 12,000 feet. Is it 12,000? 10,000 feet. 12,000 feet is a piece. So 10,000 feet in elevation, and that place had cienegas, which are sort of like bubbling up springs that are that they they just have these little marshes, and then and then the water flows from there down the mountain. So the mountain is really fecund. There's all kinds of bear, there's lion, there's deer, there's these little red squirrels. The red squirrels live there. It's sort of an island. They call it a sky island, and um, and those squirrels don't live anywhere else because they're sort of a remnant of the Pleistocene when when uh, the, the ice sheet retreated, that was what was left, and it, it, it sort of got isolated, and so these squirrels became very, um, uh, they became unique, because there wasn't any other like that. So biologists were going up there and starting to map this place and look at it, and they're like, oh my god, because they were um, starting to hear about these people down in the University of Arizona that wanted to actually take out the top of the mountain, they wanted to uh, prohibit people from going up there, they wanted to, and, you know, everybody from everywhere around there goes there for recreation for any time of the year because you can ski up there in the, in the winter time, like, you know, there's no ski lifts or anything like that, but it's a really beautiful place and it's a place where the native people um, have a very sacred relationship with. The Apache people were the people that were the, the keepers of the mountain and, and they were, you know, there's been so much, um, there's been so much uh, stopping of the, the indigenous people's uh, spiritual um, path or life that um, it was only in the 70s when uh, it became legal again for people to use drums to have their ceremonies, that kind of thing, in uh, the United States. Turtle Island for them. So they had kind of lost that connection or it was going away. There were still people that went up there but they did it very quietly because it, they weren't used to being able to do it openly. And when Earth First said, you know, we're not going to allow them to do this. We're not going to allow them just to take the place away from us and to destroy the top. And um, it would have a huge effect on all the surrounding lands and the peoples that live in those lands. So first, this little crowd of people, we would wear our squirrel and bear and raccoon outfits and we'd be at the bottom of the mountain and we'd have a, a coffee pot and we would stop people on the road and give them a little pamphlet and tell them what we were doing and why. And then they would go up to the top of the mountain and, and it was all funny and all that kind of stuff. And we, were, we joked around and we had little parties and all that kind of thing. And so people were very... Um, they were very amused, and they were also learning things, and they were starting to, the word was spreading, and so, um, so that, was, that was the little push that allowed other people to come in behind us. It allowed the Native people to get more courage and to actually reinstate their runs, because it was how they got, they go run up to the top of the mountain, they run back, and these were um, things that they did it was just little by little. Because we were the ones that started this little trend, we just put the drop on the dam, and so the drop turned into a couple more trickles, and then it turned into a torrent, and eventually they did not put 17, um, 17 scopes on the top of the mountain, and the Vatican was kicked out of the deal, so was, uh, so was Max Planck, and they only have one they have one uh, scope on the top of the mountain. So Earth First, we were used to going into places where everybody else had just turned their heads and said, we can't do anything about it. So, and we, and there's, that's still happening. There's, there's still, you know, the, one of the founders was um, uh, Mike Brozell, and he's still, he's down in Tennessee right now, and, um, and West Virginia, and just kicking ass on the uh, mountaintop of the stuff. And there's just so, and all of us that had been involved at that time are still doing things in little ways or big ways. It just, you know, some of us uh, got more into writing and, and doing uh, wilderness proposals and, and 
getting the lawyers going. The, the Center for Biological Diversity is all, they're all what's Earth Firsters, and they were my contemporaries, people that I knew. So I was very involved in the street theater stuff, and I had a great time. We had oatmeal spills at the, at the Grand Canyon because they were trying to do all this uranium mining, and so we would. Um, Roselle, I got pictures of us all wearing, you know, rad suits, and we've got oatmeal spilled everywhere, and we're trying to clean it up. And there's, you know, we got in the papers with all of that, and we were doing this at the Grand Canyon so that international people knew what was going on, they could see what was happening. And this is because there were ore trucks with uranium going through the Grand Canyon and on those roads, and they were spilling their crap. And and the people that live on the reservations up there, the people that live. Um, in the areas were having birth defects, their animals were having birth defects, it was really, uh, but that was all kind of hush hush and so our idea was to get the word out so that the public knew and we thought well the public will be behind us and I was very naive in those days. <laughs> A lot of people with me were also very naive. And so that's the kind of, that's what I was doing with Earth First. It was very fun. We had great senses of humor. We're all a bunch of rednecks. And um, so a lot of us were rural people. Um, a lot of us were educated. We're mostly white. I didn't see very many people of color in that in that crowd doing anything. And um, except when I would hook up with <coughs> the native groups that were working on keeping their sacred places, like there was the mother place of the Havasupai people that lived down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and it's up at a place called Red Butte, which is actually where we uh, later, after the powwows and all the talk and, and you know we worked with the people that were trying to do this above ground um, we were very adamant we tried for years and eventually the people that were up in Flagstaff that were just beating their heads against the wall came to Earth First and said you gotta help us and we were willing to do things that was sketchy we were willing to go and and climb up on head frames on these big mines and stuff and we had climbers among us and they would lock on and then they'd have cops would have to go get climbers so that they could climb up there and take them off them. And so um, we were making it a little bit more <coughs> difficult for them to do this. Most of the time we were, we were active in the, at all the, at the national parks. Grizzly habitat was being taken away by um, building RV sites on the grizzly habitat. And it's like, you know, grizzly habitat is, um, grizzlies are not going to go away because there's an RV park. <laughs> They're going to go down there and go, where's all the berries? Well, there's no berries, and I guess we'll just eat the people. So they, it's like they, there was no forethought, and there was no um, working in alliance with nature at all. And my whole scene was working in alliance with nature. So Earth First, we were educated. We kind of had a lot of, um, you know, we wanted to know what it took for the land to be healthy. We wanted to know what it took for the animals to be healthy and stuff like that. So. Um, so that was what we did at first, and um, you know, it was fun, and people got arrested, and we'd be in jail for five hours or something like that, and and, that, and you know, there would always be somebody for when doing civil disobedience, there was always somebody that was dogging the person that was deciding to be arrested. I mean, you know, when you started the the um, nonviolence training and the role playing and all that kind of stuff, there's always the group who's going to be arrested. Somebody's going, I'm going to be arrested. And then who's going to be the, um, the dog person to follow the arrestee through their scene so that you can make sure that the keys get back to their house or that the, the spouse gets called or that the work gets called and all that kind of stuff so that it was very organized and, and we, that's how we operated and it was really fun and I was always one of the dogs. I was always, you know, following somebody through the system. But it usually didn't last very long, a couple hours. So, um, I got arrested for the first time in my whole life um, in 1987. I was at the Round River Rendezvous. I was at the Round River Rendezvous in, in um, Idaho the year before, and I was all jacked up and mad, pissed off because they were not running. They were running a generator for the stage, and I'm like, "Aren't we supposed to be ecologically minded?" And and they're like, "Well," and they're rednecks. Well, no, we got a generator, man. So that's what we did. So I I said, "Well." Well, when it goes to Arizona, I'm going to be on the committee and I'm going to do it with Solon. So that's what I did. I, they put me on the committee and I organized everything. So we're going to, do, this is like, you know, the hippie scene. So 
um, I'm saying, okay, we're going to do recycling, we're going to do solar, we're going to have a, um, the, the Forest Service said we could go up there and do our big camp out as long as we had a, a truck with, with 120 gallons of water in it. And I worked for the Forest Service, I knew how to find a truck that had 120 gallons, and so, um, so I did all of that. And, and did all the on the ground logistics and everything. It was a total, it took a whole year to get all this stuff done and we got it done. It was a great rendezvous. And that was the rendezvous where they, uh, Ra, uh, Mike Roselle asked who wanted to get arrested. We're going to climb up the head frame at the, the canyon mine. No, not the canyon mine, pigeon mine. Um, on the north of the Grand Canyon, he said, who wants to get arrested tonight? To get arrested. Well, I was born in Arizona, and um, that's my home turf, and so I decided to do that. So I didn't tell my husband I was married at the time. He's a Forest Service guy, and uh, was gone for a week, and then we had a big uh, deal where we all um, there was about four people. <coughs> There's about four people that uh, wanted to get up on the head frame and locked down and they were climbers and really bold and daring and so they got up at four o'clock or two o'clock in the morning or whatever they did and they went down snuck into the mine and climbed to the head frame so they actually had a shaft in the ground at that time and they were pulling ore out that's on the north room of the grand canyon and the rest of us that were going to get arrested were going to sit in front of the gates and we're going to not allow the trucks the ore trucks to go go past us so um Sheriffs were there. They said, "How many people are going to get arrested?" So we have enough people to put in the, you know, enough the paddy wagons and everything. And we said, "Oh, about probably 20 or so." So they got the right amount of paddy wagons for us. And um, so it was all this little dance that we were doing. It was a civil disobedience dance. And the sheriffs were totally—they were cool. They were like, "Yeah, we don't like this shit so much. That's kind of a pain in the ass." And and then we had, of course. They had to bring in more people. There were helicopters with, the, you know, KTAR, uh, Channel 5, and, and Channel 12, and all these people came up. Because we had people in hotel rooms um, in Fredonia, which is a little town not too far away, that were just on the phones. And this is in the 80s. And they were just calling everybody and getting as much information out there so that the, the people can come out and take a look at this. And we got all kinds of great pictures. We got on the front page of, this, of the, all the newspapers in Arizona. And we had these beautiful you know, banners with rainbows and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, I was a raccoon, and I was standing with a skunk on one side and a frog on the other side. And we are arm and leg together, and we're standing there. And, and, uh, and then the cops, uh, the cops that came to arrest us were, um, um, they were DPS. And DPS are way, they have no sense of humor. They do not like to drive on dirt roads because their cars are too clean. They don't want them to be dirty. And so they had to drive 22 miles on this dirt road to come and get us, and they were mad because they wanted to go eat donuts somewhere or something. I don't know, but it was, they were not happy that they had to come down and deal with us. And then the other thing that was really stupid is there were people playing guitars and they were singing and it was like we were all dancing around like we were having a party and it was like really pissed them off. So the sheriffs were like just standing around, you know, smoking cigarettes and going, yeah, well, we'll just wait till this is over and we'll pick them up and take them down the road. So, um, so they were much more casual. That wasn't the case in California. California sheriffs there were very awful. But in Arizona, it was pretty easy going. So um, the, we had a, a DPS guy who was coming up to us with a big old, you know, stick. He's going, you know, he's looking at us and we're looking at him. And we're just all smiling at him. He goes, you better get off the road. We said, are we under arrest? And he said, you just better get off the road. We said, well, we're not going to do anything until we're under arrest. So we sat down. And so then he's going to thump on us because he's just really mad that he had to drive his car down there and everything. And so um, I was right in front of him and I stuck my feet out. I'm not very good at, at um, civil disobedience. And I stuck my feet into his legs and he fell down on top of us. And so we're not supposed to do that in, in uh, civil disobedience. You know? So you're supposed to be passive and all that kind of stuff. And I learned that I, that's not my forte. I can't do that. I'm too rebellious. And so um, Dave Foreman was there, and his wife was right next to me, and um, this guy named John Seed was there, and both of them, John Seed has seen people get 
brutally beat up in, in Australia. And he saw people get really trashed because some cop got pissed off. And I'm extremely naive. This is the first time I've ever been arrested, and I'm just not going to take this asshole in my face. So he fell down and didn't hit us because he fell down. And then, um, and then both Dave Foreman and, and uh, John C. jumped all over this guy's crap and said, you better think you didn't do anything, they didn't do anything, and blah, 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 blah. So he really got shamed out of hitting us, which was very lucky for us because he had the stick and we didn't, we were on the ground. So we ended up getting arrested. They finally arrested us. And we went in the paddy wagons and we went to the cars and then they took us to Fredonia. And uh, actually they, they took us to a bus, the, the sheriff's had this great big bus. And these guys were the marshals. I don't know if anybody here, how many people here have been arrested. So you know the difference between different kinds of cops, right? Like there's the sheriffs, and then there's the DPS, and then there's the city cops, and then there's the FBI, and then there's the marshals. And the marshals also do not have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> and so the marshals were, they're bad. And we have the U.S. Marshals down in, and they have to take us from Fredonia, which is right next to Utah, and take us down to the Coconino County Jail, which they did not have enough room for us all. I was like, oh man, they didn't want to take us down there. This is the first time that we are going to be in jail for more than five hours. This is when, um, when we started doing this stuff, it was kind of a jokey, jokey thing, and the FBI started throwing these, um, different agencies, these different cop agencies, information about how dangerous we are. And fear was definitely injected into their training against people like us. And our whole deal was, we're going to change the world, we're going to have fun doing it. And uh, so that was the first time. So we're, there's all of us are chained together, we're in the bus, I'm a cheerleader, I'm not an organizer, I'm not anything important, but I love to sing a song. So we're singing things like We Shall Overcome and, um, you know, something about like being on the mountain and all that kind of stuff. And we're singing some of the stuff that was things that were being sung by people in Mississippi summer and uh, in the civil rights stuff. And we had a, we had a black cop in front who was sitting right Next to me, I was in the very front, and we were all chained together, and so I got everybody to, to you know, take their chains in time. And what we were trying to do when we were going across the river where the dam was, is we were trying to, um, to make enough noise for that precision earthquake so that the dam would break, which really freaked out these guys. They had no sense of humor about this at all. So we're singing and having a great time, and I'm sitting in my little raccoon suit, and. And I say, so, as one coon to another, and I'm talking to this, this fellow in front of me, and he's over there cracking up, he's trying really hard not to laugh, and he's laughing, and the two white guys in the front of us were really, really bad, and they didn't let us go pee, and they, didn't, they weren't nice at all. So we ended up going to jail. One of the women that was doing the pat-downs and all of that kind of stuff, they were more polite in those days, they didn't do that bend over and spread your cheeks kind of thing. They do that now, but they didn't do that then. So she was very concerned for us and told us that she really believed in what we were doing. This is somebody that's patting us down and getting shredded and going to jail. And they separated the women and the men, and so um, we had to get a lawyer. We, we had one of the guys that was on the out there um, at the site was a lawyer, so he came in and, and they did all their tactics of saying, well, they said this over in the, you know, they're going to talk over in the, in the men's you know, prison and, and, the, 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 and they would say the same thing to the men about what the women were doing. So they wouldn't let us tell, talk to each other. They wouldn't let us, they tried to separate us in our minds. They tried to um, make us um, mad at each other and all that kind of stuff. And our whole thing was when we decided to get arrested that we were going to go as John and Jane Doe. So nobody gave their name. <laughs> so we ended up in there for three days, which was a really long time in those days. And um, and we had, you know, the, the 
Flagstaff was just packed with people walking up and down the, the main drag where the jail was, you know, with their placards and all that kind of stuff. And so it was really a big deal. It was very uncomfortable for the people in the town. And so we ended up, they had to take us to Fredonia. And one of the things that, the, that your dog was always doing for you, I had Tom Terrific as my guy, and um, was we would, they would bring us clothes so that when we go to court, we could be dressed in, you know, civilian clothes. Or the clothes that we were wearing when we had to get into our little uh, jumpsuits. And I told him not to bring, I was dressed as a raccoon, I said just make sure that I keep my raccoon suit. So when I went to court three days later, I went as a raccoon. And when I went in front of the judge, I went as a raccoon. And I said I'm representing the animal kingdom. <laughs> Mammals in particular and raccoons in, you know, specifically. So, um, so he was just like, oh, I can't believe I'm seeing this. And, uh, and there was 20 of us. So everyone had, you know, major things that they were saying and doing and poems and all this kind of stuff. And he just never seen anything like it. Just, they just wanted to get us out of there. So they gave us time to serve and got us out of there. So that was the first time I ever got arrested. That was in 1987. And after that rendezvous, uh, I was approached by a friend of mine or a guy that I knew in town who really wanted to do <coughs> monkey wrench. And Earth First always had a little, in their uh, magazine, they always had a, a Dear Ned Ludd section, and it was always about monkey wrenching. And so we had a dialogue in our paper about monkey wrenching. So there was always little you know, tips on how to spike trees, there was tips on how to down, um, uh, down billboards, there's tips on how to, you know, uh, d disable large uh, heavy equipment, there were tips on how to spike roads, all kinds of stuff. And so uh, eventually they wrote a book and Dave Foreman edited it and it's called A Field Guide to Monkey Ranching. And it's got a lot of really great tips in it. And um, so that was I think one of the one of the big things that the feds wanted to put on trial was this book. But anyways, I digress. I was walking down the street. I get a phone call from a, a friend of mine who works in the county, and she says the county is just getting ready to bring in animal damage control, and they're going to put thirty thousand dollars towards killing off every little predator on the planet that's anywhere near Prescott, Arizona. And I was like. Oh. She said, and they're not telling anybody, it's not public, I'm telling you because I know you're going to try and do something about it. So I ran into this guy, Mark Davis, who'd been talking to me about monkey ranching and who I would always turn away from and walk away from because I wasn't, you know. But I was starting to get madder and madder, and I was starting to think, you know, I've always been a rebellious sort, and maybe it would be interesting. And I had already cut down some billboards, and I'd already, and this is all, you know, Statue of Limitations, I've done this whole time. <laughs> and um, for all of you FBI agents in the room, and you know who you are. Um, so, so I was starting to think about the possibility. So he saw me, I was a weak moment, he helped me. He was um, very instrumental in starting an uh, organization called Teros in, in Phoenix, and it was about helping people that were on the suicide. Uh, scene. So, like, he would he would go up into towers and talk people off of telephone poles and shit like that. And he was amazing. He was he was a, a Sikh at some point. He was he was just he was a kickboxer. He was very athletic, and he was he sort of corresponded. If anybody here has read any of Ed Rebbe's stuff, um, the Mike Wrench Gang, he sort of corresponded with Hayden in the way he thought, a little bit incendiary, so to speak. So, um. He came up to me, he saw me in angst and distress and said, what's going on? I told him about the thing that was going on in the county. And he said, well, look, we'll just start a phone tree. Get your phone book out. So I got my phone book out and I called everybody on my phone tree, you know, everybody that I had in my phone book. And we got people mobilized. And they went, we went to the press and we got some people in the press to go to the county and to out them about what they were doing. And all of a sudden, they couldn't. <laughs> put out this $30,000 to animal damage control. And all of a sudden, there was a controversy. And all of a sudden, they couldn't just go and do this under the table because it got out 
the information got out. So, so there's all these different ways that you can make things happen. And so um, I had to take all this, like I was doing the recycling, I had to take the truck and trailer, or the trailer back and all of the cans that I had borrowed from these people in the flag staff, I had to take them back up there. And so Mark Davis said, I'll ride with you. I'll help you. And I went, great. So we drove up. We are coming back. He goes, I want to take out the ski lift. <laughs> really? <laughs> That'd be a really nice thing. And he goes, no, I'm serious. I don't really want to do it. And I'm like, really? And so our everything that we did that was went above and beyond, everything that we did that was really illegal was about sacred lands. And so I think that was what protected us. I mean, I went to jail for it, but I didn't go to jail for very long. And I learned a lot. I needed to go through that. I remember going up to the top of, the, of Agassiz, which is one of the high mountains, one of the high peaks at, um, that's 12,000 feet up in northern Arizona, uh, San Francisco peaks. And my friend Ilsa and I, she came across this, this story bowl, is what she thinks it was. It's probably, it's over a thousand years old, but some archaeologist guy gave her this story bowl. And it came from Anasazi. And so she and I, when we, she brought it to me and we sat and we went, this bull has a lot of power. And so it was a, you know, a big bull. And so, or a jar, I guess it was a jar. So we took it to the top of the mountain one time. And we watched the sunset from the top of the mountain, 12,000 feet. And as the sunset, this is not exactly the most She's a pretty strong person and outdoorsy in certain ways, but she had not thought about walking down the mountain after dark, which I had. I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be really cool. And she was like, oh, my God, I'm scared. But we went up to the top of the mountain, and we brought this bowl, and we sat, and we prayed, and we cried in the bowl. And we said, God, goddess, because we talk about the goddess, please use us. Please be, make us your vehicle. We don't know what to do to change things, but we want to help somehow. So be careful what you ask for. My take on what the goddess did for me is she gave me, because I'm hard-headed and I had a lot of ego involved and I was grandiose as hell, she said, well, you're a little dense, girlfriend, so I'm going to have to use the ball peen method of enlightenment and use a ball peen hammer on your head. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened to me. Ilsa didn't have it quite the same. She didn't have to go through the ball peen method, but she definitely, we both got tumbled around a lot in the, in the tumbler. So we came down from that. We went to the powwows, the Havasupai were having. We went to the powwows that the Wallapai were having, and we offered our services to the people there and said, we don't know what you need us to do, but we want to be of service. So they had their methods and what they wanted to do and their focus and all that. And they, what they did is they had a great big powwow where they called in all the religious people, anybody that had a spiritual past. So we had Buddhists there. We had Tibetans there. We had people from all over the planet that came there. They put the word out. This is before the Internet. And they came there and prayed and stayed for days. And we danced all, all night long with drums and just was, we just did this big thing and we had that bowl there and we had it there and we didn't take it out in public, we took it out into the forest and we prayed and so that was, that was before Mark Davis, you know, dropped that little bum and said I want to do, I want to take out the ski lift and so when he did that, I took it as a sign. <laughs> okay. So, um, I decided that I would give, I, I would try this because I think um, yes. Monkey Ranching has a place, and so um, so I went in cahoots with him. So Mark Davis didn't know how to use a settling torch, and so he decided that he wanted to cut the um, pylons. He wanted to cut the bolts on the pylons of the ski lift. Actually, he wanted to cut the, the towers that were holding the ski lift up and. We talked him out of that because he's, he's a little bit more.
grandiose than the rest. <laughs> like, maybe we don't want to watch it go because we might be under it and maybe we'll die. And so let's just cut the bolt so that when the wind comes, it'll go down. Because that's how we did the, the, um, the billboards. You cut them all the way through almost. Of course, now it's all metal, so you kind of have to find a way to, to use the the selling torch and that kind of stuff, and that's a little bit more difficult. But anyway, to see the new technology. Um, so that was what we were going to do. And so I got involved with him, and then Ilsa got involved with him, and they got involved romantically as well. And um, and so it was uh, starting to get a little bit interesting. In 1987, <laughs> um, he had, um, this was after the rendezvous. So, there was a guy that had moved into town in 1987. His name was Ron Frazier. In 1987, when we, um, we staged a lot of uh, the preparation for the stuff yes. at the North of the Grand Canyon from Prescott, because that's where I live, and there was other people on the committee that lived there. And that was the year, that summer, that the FBI opened an office on the ground floor of the courthouse. So we didn't know any of this until way later. But that's when they opened their, their office. So I believe that they were setting us up while we were setting ourselves up for what happened. Um, so it's like simultaneously stuff is getting into place. So the feds are now in Prescott because they know that we're doing a rendezvous at the, at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And they are um, crawling all over the town. And there's this guy named Ron Frazier that shows up in town, and he wants to learn how to be a diesel mechanic so he can sabotage diesels. And he moved into the trailer park that my friend Ilsa was living at with her children and her husband. And he became very helpful to Ilsa and her children. He was her babysitter for a while. And, um, and in the official documents, in the transcripts of the trial that happened years later, he says he turned towards the FBI after he was thwarted by Ilsa romantically, and um, and he was thwarted by uh, Mark Davis also. That's what he says. I believe, personally, and Ilsa will contest me on that, I believe that he was in the pay of the FBI when he got there to press him. In 1987, I believe that. Now, Ilsa will argue up one side down the other that that's not the case, but I do believe that. So, so each of us has a different perspective. Who the heck knows what the reality is? But that's where I'm thinking. Maybe he did come and was just an innocent, weird guy that didn't have a spiritual life that had been indicted for molestation of children, uh, assault with a deadly weapon, and animal cruelty and been kicked out of Bisbee, Arizona before he came to Prescott. Those things happened before he ever came to Prescott, and I believe, and they're not on his record now. So I believe the FBI brought him in and, and had him uh, groomed as an informant before he came in, but that's, that's up for debate. Um, so anyway, he shows up and he's getting really involved with Ilsa and Mark Davis, and he wants to, he wants to get involved with us. He goes to a rendezvous. He has a monkey wrenching workshop on how to mess up heavy equipment at the rendezvous, and that was in uh, that was in 1988. Um, that was the year that. Um, let's see, we did some stuff in '87. What did we do in '87? We we uh, did the pylon thing at the north at the uh, at the ski lift. So what we did is we. Um, Mark and I walked up to the top of the mountain and in the dark, and we walked back down off, off the mountain in the dark. So we didn't have a flashlight, and we just walked up and down the mountain to see what we could do, if we could do it, blah, blah, blah. We recruited some other people that I don't ever mention their names because they never got indicted and they never got, but they're people that were also from Arizona, and um, there were some people from Colorado that actually they had a subpoena for, but they left the country before they got subpoenaed. So those guys are all, they never, nothing happened for them, so I don't mention who they are and that kind of stuff. But there was a lot more people involved than just me, Ilsa, and Mark 
and then we brought in this guy named Mark Baker for our other thing that we were going to do later. So we did the ski lift first. Ski lift is on a sacred mountain called the San Francisco Peaks. It is a place for the, have, for the, um, the Hopi people. Their whole Kachina cosmology is a, is a revolves around the peaks. So half of the year the Kachinas come out of the peaks, and then half of the year they go down underground or under in the underworld. So half the year they're un, in the underworld, and half the year they're on the, the above world. So the peaks is where they come and go out of. The Diné people have uh, five sacred mountains that surround their lands, and the, the peaks are, are one of those five sacred mountains. Um, they do um, pilgrimages there. It's a really important, uh, important place for them. The, the mountains um, originally were a huge volcano that blew its top 10,000 years ago. And uh, so it's very volatile. There's a lot of energy in that mountain. And right next to the mountain, up at the Grand Canyon, all around, there are brescia pipes. And brescia pipes are these, these, um, these tubes um, that, um, I think they are tubes where lava came out. And also, there is uranium in those pipes. And that is what all the uranium mining is all about. They might go over and pull them out of the pipes. Now, all the people who live up there know about the pipes and where they are located. They also know that they do not want to ever take any of that stuff out of the ground because it's supposed to be in the ground. So people that live up there know because they can feel the energy of the uranium and all that kind of stuff and they just acknowledge it and do their prayer work around it and that's what it's for. So the mother place of the Havasupai is right where there's a big pressure pipe and that's where they're going to pull out. They're doing a canyon mine there. So we've been fighting um, the uranium scene. It's still going on. There's still people trying to pull um, stuff out of the, the ground in the north um, rim of the Grand Canyon and all around the Grand Canyon, about around the peaks and all that kind of stuff. There's still major controversies going on around the peaks. Right now, at this very moment, the Diné are working their asses off to try and get this thing changed. They're, tr they're using different um, focuses. The main focus, um, that Cleve Benali and some of the folks that he's been working with are using is the Sacred Lands one, which of course, you know, nobody gives a rat's ass about Sacred Lands. So, um, so that's their focus and they're gonna really continue to work on that. There's also, the thing that saved Mount Graham pretty much for, was the fact that it had this red squirrel on it and, and there was enough biologists that went up there that went, we're not gonna let this happen. Um, the not, the, the uh, Apache people, um, fought tooth and nail as well from their angle and so we all were, we were a coalition, we were an anchor. There were lots of different people, ang Anglos and, and Native people and that's what's going on up in the Peaks area now too. So um, it's still happening, it's not going away. They still haven't put in at the canyon mine where we did our ceremonies and where we did our sabotage. <clears throat> so. Not only was I doing sabotage with my friends, I was also doing ceremonies with my friends. And so we were working with the people on many, many, many different levels. One of the big ceremonies that we did in 1987 at the solstice, the winter solstice, was we had a, a woman's gathering at the um, mother place of the Havasupai, which is up by Red Butte, which is right south of Grand Canyon, south of and they had and they had a head frame up and they had um, 17 acres was fenced in and they had the mining <coughs> machinery in there and all that kind of stuff <coughs> right over the brush pipe and, and so we put together a group there was uh, we asked for women from the northern part of the state to join us with their kids or without their kids to um, do a spiral dance around the 17 acres to bring back this feminine energy to bring back um, our connection, to make it more apparent, and to bring back the energy that has been dissipated as far as, as uh, the female part of the equation is concerned. And we had a lot of trouble with the boys in Flagstaff that were like, well, we want to go over there, and we want to drum, and we want to you know, beat our chests and do all this kind of stuff. And we're like, no, gentlemen, we would really like you to come up and be our support. We want you to stage for us, we want you to build a fire and keep it warm. We want you to take care of the kids while we're doing this spiral dance thing. 
and um, you can drum there, and you can you know you can keep the latrines and just make a place for us to come back to when we're done. And we're going to go out there and just do what we're going to do. We weren't going to have a big, huge thing. There's only 36 women that came. It was um, put together by myself, Ilsa, and uh, Lady and Mary Soldier. We had a vision in our heads, sort of. It was sort of not really. It was kind of nebulous, and um, and it just happened. The women that wanted to sit in front of a fire made a fire right at the gate. The women that wanted to do a drumming circle did one over here. The rest of us <coughs> set up flags and we did the spiral dance. Some of us took our shoes off. It was really intense. When the sun went down is when we began. So there's snow up there. It's really cold. It's like, it's like 10,000 feet, 9,000 feet there. So we got it done. Uh, the people that were, there was a whole bunch of, the sheriffs came, we, did, we told everybody, we weren't, you know, trying to hide it or anything. So the sheriffs were there for a while, and they were just like, oh, um. so they finally drove away. And then the miners came, and they just occupied their mining scene, and oh, before they came, there's the dogs, you know, so we're giving them treatments. <laughs> Inside the, the gate, the fence, they were like, you know, the guard dogs, and, and so we were just like, having fun with them. And so, the, the miners came, and they were wearing um, animal hats, and you know, just you know, they're making fun of us, and we're like, yeah, that's okay, we don't care. So we had a fire, we did the ceremony, we were done. We were, uh, the the people, well, we were most of the way done, and then these guys that were in the in the mine were like, we are just so bored, this is ridiculous, and so they were going to drive out, but they were very respectful. They opened the gate, they took some shovels, and they moved the fire over to the side so that they could drive out without hitting the fire and without putting the fire out. So they were scared, or they were respectful. I don't know what they were, but I know that their eyes were like this when they were doing it. <laughs> and so we made an amoeba of people. We held hands, and we just surrounded the cars as they, as they came out. We, we were at the gate. They came in. We surrounded them. We, we went with them uh, down the driveway a little ways, and we said our names to them. We told them our names. And we opened it up at that end, and they could drive out. They finally was like, oh, I'm going to And so um, it was really scary to them, because they didn't know about Lulu. And you know, we, were, we had pulled up some pretty intense energy at the time. So that was one of the things that we did. The person, the two men that came, all the rest of the guys over in Flagstaff were puffing and puffing and they didn't come. But the two men that came, one was the informant and he, who was being paid. He took care of the latrines, which I thought was quite perfect. And the other guy was, was, was Mark Davis, who was part of our crew and, and who wanted to, he was really wanting to do this stuff that went bump the night. What Ilsa, Mark and Mark and I did um, at that uranium mine later on is we came out there one night and the feds were out there too, just so you know, because I had an FBI agent start using me as the port of entry. He gave me a ride back from 1988 rendezvous in Washington State. He drove me back with the informant, the three of us were in the car, to Arizona because I didn't have a ride back. He was very handsome. He was uh, sort of like a redneck cowboy kind of guy, which I grew up in Arizona. And I used to hit the rodeo season, and I was very attracted to that kind of person. And so he, um, you know, I've heard people, you know, activists that have been, you know, targeted by the FBI say, oh, they're all a bunch of bumbling idiots, and that is correct. There's a lot of them. They're bumbling idiots. And they're also very cagey, and there are people that are very, meticulously doing profiles on people. They are very scary in a lot of ways. And so they did profiles on us, and I got the profile of the, you know, the redneck cowgirl kind of thing. So um, I was very well known in the groups as a dancer. I, dan I still dance. I dance in a belly dance troupe. I dance on the dance floor. I love to dance. And so they sent me a really, really good dancer. <laughs> It was great. We had a lot of fun. And um, and they sent me somebody that was just, you know, perfect. So the good thing is I was married and I was not going to cheat on my husband. 
in any way, shape, or form, even if I had a crush on somebody. And, um, and he worked me pretty hard. I think um, he was really relieved that, there was, that I wasn't going to be forward about anything like that. But um, he definitely was working that angle. He also helped me build a sweat lodge, which I completely took apart the opposite direction that we put it together. Because I, I did sweats in those days. I've done one in a while, but I used to do a lot of sweats with the Apache Yavapai people. Stuff. And so I had one built up at my place. I lived 10, 17 miles away from town at a place called Palace Station. It's made, it was built in 1874, and there was no way the feds could put little bionic ears anywhere because we knew where they were at all times. So anybody that drove out there, we knew where they were and who they were and all that kind of stuff. So they really couldn't. The other thing they couldn't do is they couldn't put bionic ears inside of our house because it was forest service housing, and it was against the law. But they did put ears in Ilse's house and Mark's house and Mark's house, and they did have recordings of their private lives in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the bedroom. And um, that stuff is, I don't know where it is, it might still be in their coffers, I don't know. But anyway, they spent thousands and millions, they spent $3 million on us. The FBI informant got $53,000 for his part. He was kept in his drugs. He loved LSD and pot, and so he was always kept in LSD and pot. And he always had a car, and he always had, you know, he always had, he was always okay, you know. He was indigent when he got there, but he didn't stay that way. So, uh, the other FBI agent, was, uh, agent, the other FBI informant, there's another guy named uh, Mike Gooch. Mike Gooch. Um, he was a Prescott College student. I went to Prescott College. I graduated in 83. And in 87, Mike Gooch was there. Ilse's husband at the time was an instructor at Prescott College. And they went and got Mike Gooch. He was a, a southerner who had absolutely no teeth. They were rotten, all of them, every last one of them. So he got new teeth. Now, he was a poor boy, and I have no idea how he got those new teeth until I found out that he was an informant as well. So there were a lot of informants that they brought in. Um, I think they find, they look for people that don't have a really strong center. They look for people that are, are willing to compromise themselves. They look for people that are addicted to drugs or alcohol or anything. So that's who they bring in. And those are the idiots because they're usually fueled by grandiosity and all that kind of stuff. Now, I was also fueled by grandiosity. I was going to change the world. I was going to be a hero, blah, 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 blah. And Mark Davis was really grandiose. And so I sort of, you know, got on his tail and was flying up the stars with him as well. So, um, so that was our downfall. Uh, and of course, the FBI could not get a recording of us together with anybody except for either the informant or the FBI agent. So Mark and I are never on a tape together. Ilsa and I are never on a tape together. Mark and I are never on a tape together. So all they have is me and the FBI agent, Mark Davis and the informant, Ilsa and the informant, um, Mark Baker and the FBI agent. So they didn't get us in a conspiracy setting. They tried really really hard. Ed Meese made it possible for them to do all these tapes and, um, and that was the beginning of the, you know, and you know when people are going NSA, NSA, I just laughed my ass off because they've been doing this shit a long time. This, this is just like the tip of the iceberg, guys. So I'm just like, really? I'm, I'm so glad that now people are like upset about it, but it's been forever that they've been doing this. COINTELPRO started years and years ago, and you know, the weathermen and all these other you know, students for Democratic Society, the AIM, uh, the Black Panthers, all those, I mean, they've been doing this a long time. The Pinkertons were the, prever the people that started the FBI, and they were doing that kind of crap. So when people get all upset about it, it's like, well, now we can do something, maybe, I don't know. Maybe they're just going to flap their jaws about it, I don't know. 